Hey everyone, uh, so welcome to Gen AI and Open Educational Resources and Teaching and Learning. Um, there's two co-facilitators today. Uh, my name is Lucas Wright. I recognize a lot of faces, which is great. I am um, a senior learning technology, sorry, senior educational consultant focused on learning technology. And I've been doing that for about the last 13 years at UBC, where, and I've been helping faculty, staff, and students work and think about different learning technologies and mainly have the conversation. Um, related to this session, I had the privilege of working for BC Campus for one year as an open education advisor a couple of years ago. And, you know, my interest in AI only started a couple of years ago compared to a lot of folks in here you know, folks like Nordine with a lot of expertise. Um, I started a couple of years ago and became really obsessed with it and started, you know, just as chat GPT started emerging as having this uh, really strong potential and ability to create natural writing. Um, I started really obsessing over it and researching and playing. And I've had the opportunity to do lots of presentations. So I've presented about 30 times now, and I've got to learn from people each presentation. So I come to you not with expertise in this area, but kind of through my obsession, my research and my opportunity to do work uh, workshops. So welcome. Will, go ahead. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I also recognize a lot of faces in the room. I'm Will Engel. I'm a strategist for Open Education Initiatives at UBC Vancouver's Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology. Uh, and what that means is I work on one level with both faculty and students who want to use open educational practices or resources in their teaching and learning. And then on another level, I, I work on sort of broader university initiatives um, like our OER grants. Uh, I've been in this position for about 12 years. Um, and supporting open ed at various different levels during that time. Um, I'm really excited to be here to be co-presenting with Lucas. Um, I, I come from sort of the opposite place where I've been maybe avoiding uh, looking at AI as it relates to open. And, and so really excited to be able to um, engage with Lucas and learn from his practices here and, and here, as well as everybody else in the room. Um, I hope there'll be some good sharing happening today as well. Wonderful. So I'm gonna share slides and you can jump right in well. So before we get started, we would like to acknowledge that UBC Vancouver, uh, which is hosting this session, is located on the tra traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Um, and as we're online today, you may be coming in from other uh, territories, and please feel free to share those. Um, as this session will be talking about open education, I do like to acknowledge that Western notions of copyright law and ownership and intellectual property can be in tension with Indigenous and traditional ways of knowing. We'll be talking about that a little bit um, in this session today, but we won't be doing a deep dive into that topic. Um, however, Kayla Larson, who's the Indigenous Programs and Services Librarian for WeWa Library at UBC, um, hosted a session last year that was specifically about these tensions. And I'm just gonna drop a link to the recording of that session. So if you're interested in this topic, I do really encourage you to, to check out the recording of that session, it was fantastic. So today, our agenda is we're going to be providing just sort of a, a high-level overview of Gen AI, as well as OER. And we're going to talk a bit about and demonstrate how Gen AI can be used um, for OER. And then we're going to take sort of a deep look at some of the issues and tensions that exist between these sort of two areas. And then finally, we hope to end um, with some future directions that AI might be pushing uh, the open education and OER communities. And I just wanted to mention, um, Will and I, when we were planning this session, um, you know, there are really large issues and tensions, and we're always kind of deciding whether we talk about how we can use Gen AI for OER, or whether we want to talk about issues first. So we've put issues a little bit later, but um, to underscore that we see these as really important uh, to address. Yeah, exactly. So what we kind of hope that will happen with this session is that you'll leave it with a little bit of a understanding of how Gen AI, Gen AI can be used to support or enhance the creation or adaption of OER. Um, some considerations for the use of Gen AI for OER, specifically um, you know, exploring and thinking about privacy, equity, bias, and copyright considerations. Um, some implications for the future of OER, and then uh, maybe a draft 
a chapter section of an open textbook and we'll see how that works. We're gonna um, ask you to be creating some things today. And Lucas, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Yeah, so with this session, we really would like you to have an opportunity to play with these tools a little bit, play with the prompts that we're working through and explore some of the resources as we talk the talk through them and go through them. So we've created a worksheet and you can see that right here if you go to bit.ly, gen AI OER, and maybe Will, if you have a chance to drop that in the chat now, you could as well. Um, and we encourage you to follow along with this worksheet. And you may wanna have one of these tools open for the demos, for the prompting. So as of two days ago, chat GPT 3.5 does not require a login. So you can go right to that site and use that. If you use ChatGPT4, I'm going to be doing quite a few of my demos with ChatGPT4. And the reason for that is the capability of GPT4 and Google Advance has really surpassed the free versions of the tool. And I want to kind of demo these tools at their highest level of capability. Um, you may want to have Bing Copilot open if you prefer to use that tool. And a reminder at UBC, Currently, Bing Copilot is the only tool that has achieved or received a privacy uh, impact assessment or completed successfully a private privacy impact assessment. So you can use this responsibly within your classes. And then Google Gemini, if you're interested in having this open, um, it's another tool you may want to use. Any of these tools will work for the prompts that we're doing. So we're going to start by introducing OER and generative AI, and this will be a review for most of you. So what is generative AI? Um, I grabbed this definition off Wikipedia. Um, so generative artificial intelligence is artificial intelligence that's capable of generating text, images, videos um, happening more and more with tools like Sora or other data using generative models, often in response to prompts. Generative AI, AI models learn, and I'm putting learn in air quotes there, the patterns and structure of their input and training data, and then generate new data based on complex word prediction. I think of note, as we're talking today is thinking about what these tools have been trained on. And so I wanna share a couple ways, that, a couple data sets that ChatGPT 3.5 was trained on. As these tools have become more popular and got more venture capital into them, what they're trained on is becoming less and less clear. And I think this is problematic. Um, but what we know is that ChatGPT 3.5, three of the main databases or data sets was trained on. One is Common Crawl, which is an archive similar to Google's index spanning 13 years with petabytes of web data, interconnected links, primarily in English, but also with 40 other languages. And I put a link on the worksheet um, to a a website that kind of unpacks some of the complexities in Common Crawl and talks a little bit about algorithmic curation and which data is favored and you know how that impacts our searches. Uh, Books 3 is a controversial data source for ChatGPT 3.5, and we know that it includes lots of open books. It also includes a lot of copyrighted material within this database, and there's a number of lawsuits around it right now. And then the entire Wikipedia knowledge base in the English language. So this is three of the data sources that were scraped or used, but especially with these new models, there's many other data sources using, and it is worth one, you know, asking about and trying to determine what data is being used and how. Yeah, so so that's the definition of Gen AI. Let me just talk really briefly about what open ed and open educational resources are. So I like this definition from Spark that open education is sort of an umbrella term that accompanies, a sorry, that encompasses 
resources, tools, and practices that are free of legal, financial, and technical barriers and can be fully used, shared, and adapted. And particularly in a digital environment, the internet really facilitates the sharing of resources and practices. Um, specifically, we'll be talking a lot about OER today. OER are open educational resources, and these are teaching and learning uh, resources that can include full, mo uh, full uh, courses, modules, textbooks, videos, test banks, problem sets, um, really any materials being used in an educational setting that are free of cost barriers and which often carry, um, which also carry a legal permission for open use. And generally this permission is granted through the use of an open copyright license, um, most commonly a Creative Commons license, which allows anybody to freely use, adapt, or share that resource anytime or anywhere. Great. And you know, we didn't mention this in the intro, but um, we, we've we included or we, we've interleaved activities throughout this session. And we really want you to get into these tools and play a little bit. So I'm going to start our first activity with you now. And what I'm going to do is do a quick demonstration of creating a single page of an open textbook. And then I'm going to give you the opportunity to do the same thing. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment. And I'm just going to jump onto the worksheet and grab a prompt that we worked a little bit um, creating before this session began. And what we were trying to do is kind of experiment and think about how effective the output could be in ChatGPT for Gemini, creating a short section for an open textbook with particular characteristics like a glossary um, and learning objectives within it. And you'll notice in the prompt here that I used, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with, but just in case you're not, um, I used a persona prompt here. So as a psychology professor, so we not now know from research on these tools that by giving the tool a persona, it tends to draw on more accurate and specific data. So generally in my prompts, including being very specific, I'm adding these personas to, get, to help it improve its output. So I'm gonna go into chat GPT now and I've given it that prompt. I'm in ChatGPT4. I've been careful to clean my ChatGPT history on the left-hand sidebar. And I'm just going to enter this prompt here. And let's see what we get out. The one thing I don't think we'll get is a thousand words. And what I find fascinating about demonstrating these tools is the output is always unique. And it's often different as, than I expected, which for me coming from a learning technology background is kind of scary doing demonstrations and not quite knowing what's gonna come out. So let's give this a try. Wonderful. So it's starting off with some learning objectives, explain circadian rhythm, describe a flex of steep deprivation, identify strategies for promoting healthy sleep, it's giving me an introduction to sleep, the stages of sleep, talking about non-REM, circadian rhythm and sleep. And now it's explaining a little bit around the brain activity. And we'll talk a little bit about this when we get to limitations of these tools. I am far from a sleep expert outside of naps, but without that expertise, it's very difficult for me to discern the accuracy of this document. And I think that's a real challenge when using these tools, finding out um, you know, who has the expertise to ensure the quality of the output that we're creating. And I'm just gonna try to improve this a little bit. Um, it looks pretty good from a quick read of it. So I'm gonna say act as a open textbook editor, and PhD in psychology and evaluate the following page. What criteria did you use? And the reason what I'm doing here is 
a refinement loop with the tool. So by asking the tool to act as someone else and evaluate, um, I'm getting it to refine the output a little bit. And I'm also asking it to say, what criteria did you use? And I find this fascinating with these tools. If you ask these technologies to show their work, they tend to have better output as well. It gives you an idea of what they're drawing from. So let's see what we get. So it's going to give me an evaluation of this. So it's giving me a little bit of should. We'll see if it also goes and directly evaluates. All right, based on these criteria. So now it's giving me some ideas. The structure seemed logical. I'm going to say based on this evaluation, rewrite it. And by doing these kind of loops, you can kind of go through constant refinement and even refine it from different perspectives um, as you're developing someone. So think of someone from a different expertise space and have it refine its work. So here we are, here's our refined output. Here's our refined glossary of terms. And we've now created, you know, a short, section of a text of a potential open textbook. So I'm going to stop sharing now and I'm going to turn it over to you for about, I'll give you about five minutes. And what I'd like you to do is on the worksheet, it's titled activity one, go onto the worksheet, open one of those tools. Uh, so Gemini, ChatGPT4, ChatGPT 3.5, Consider a topic in your disciplinary or area of expertise. So basically something you can do that I wasn't able to do with the sleep textbook is to analyze it, analyze the quality of the output. Use the guidelines, use the prompt that I shared with you, change the prompt around a little bit or make your own prompt and see if you can get it to generate one page of a chapter in an open textbook reflect on and after after five minutes i'll get you to share the following what worked what we're missing what were some of the challenges all right so let me start my timer at five minutes i'm going to stop sharing the screen in a moment get you to go into that worksheet and again start seeing if you can create one page of an open textbook chapter Wonderful. And I see Erica has shared kind of what worked um, in the chat there already, which is great. You can take a look at that. And if you want to share something like that, that's really helpful. You know, I noticed there's a couple folks from STEM, math, some of those areas in here. Um, it's worth noting that I think GPT in particular has shown a lot of gaps in its ability to do computation and mathematical equations. But if you are using GPT-4, um, there's a Wolfram Alpha um, plugin or extension that you can use with it to allow those tools to work together and allow you to use this computational engine with it. Again, unfortunately, and related to equity, that's only for the paid version of chat GPT right now. Yeah, I see Mark McLean mentions ChatGPT4 struggles with doing correct mathematics, though it makes fewer horrific errors, as does 3.5, was prone to often. And Mark, have you had a chance to use Wolfram when it's connected to um, ChatGPT by any chance? I haven't yet. Yeah, it's an interesting tool. If you stick around, if you have a chance, stick around at the end. I can show that to you if you'd like. Great. Okay. So thanks for doing that. Um, maybe I could ask folks to share in the chat what their broad results were. So, you know, what was the quality like? What was the output? What was missing? If you can add that to the chat. And I'll also encourage a couple people to put up their virtual hands and uh, unmute themselves and share their experience doing this. So I see that Bree mentions in the chat, this was effective to generate structure and a starting point. It's bland and generic until you push it in a specific direction. 
Really good point. So we see that it struggles with math. We see from Erica, Canadian examples were missing for her. Um, good basics. Over-reliance on bullet points, says Cora. And I noticed that as well. I was getting really bulleted point text quite quickly. Tom Quilly mentioned what worked. The answer was concise and included the main characteristics I was looking for. What didn't work, it wasn't able to compare contrast the subject matter with something similar. The choice of prompt was super crucial. I had to go back and refine my prompts to get more specific info. And absolutely, I think prompting... Um, I'm really not a fan of the term prompt engineering. I think that depending on our discipline, prompt can really be a craft. And there's a lot to effective prompting. What was missing? Personality. I love that, um, Ali. And Christina Middlemass mentions it hits key points. So a useful introduction, lacks specific examples. I'm going to turn it over to Will now. Thanks for doing that activity and participating so actively. Yeah, and I'll just jump in and just to respond to that a little bit. I also think in the open ed space, um, an area where we see the most general resources being used are in sort of the year one and year two courses. Um, and that's where you have very large courses with very expensive textbooks often used. So there's this big push um, for creating um, OER in those sort of introductory courses um, just because of the high use of, of, of textbooks and, and those where um, higher level courses may not be using textbooks and relying more upon instructor knowledge. Um, so every every textbook, uh, almost every course module is not just text, of course. Um, and one of the things that they have is a summative um, quiz at the end of the chapter. And we're just gonna play around with some these AI tools to see, can we create a summative quiz? Um, I'm just gonna take over screen sharing for a sec and jump in. I'm gonna just play with Gemini um, and just ask, it to create a quiz based on the same same topic of sleep. Um, normally what I would do is I would try to feed in the uh, materials that's already been created to create that. But uh, Lucas and I are on separate computers today. Um, so that's a little hard to do. So I'm just gonna ask it to go from, from the background. So I'm just copying that general prompt and I'm gonna go ahead and plug it in. So again, I have that personality prompt as a psychology professor, create a summative multiple choice quiz about the psychology of sleep, create four questions with four alternatives for each answer. Um, let's see what it comes up with. There, you never quite know. I find that this does make um, this a little hard for demonstrating this. Um, so it has a, some instructions. Um, it says which the following is not a stage of sleep: non-rapid, uh, rapid eye movement, deep sleep, wakefulness. Um, so pretty basic question. No indication of of what's marked right or wrong there. Um, that's okay. I, I would assume I'd be an expert in this field. Um, and you can see it's nicely formatted. You can play with this a little bit um, to make it harder, just to, to show, like, because I'm not an expert, I'm going to ask it um, to redo the above, um, but mark correct answers. And let's see if it marks those correct answers. Yeah, so now it's providing a little bit of some correct answers and incorrect answers, um, letting me know know what they are, not perfect formatting this time. Um, now I'm gonna ask, we do the above, but. Um, ask it to provide a, a sentence of feedback for each incorrect answer um, and see. Wakefulness is a distinct state from sleep characterized by alertness and responsible uh, stimuli. So that's pretty correct. Um, incorrect. REM sleep is associated with decreased muscle activity and increased brain activity, making it a state closer to wakefulness. So it's getting some, some general um, information here that I could easily copy and paste into our open textbook and reformat it. Um, often, though, we know that OER is not just static text. It's often online and is using tools. Um, and more, what I find really interesting is a lot of the educational technology tools are beginning to, um, to think about how they can design to be use AI. And I'm just going to show a very common um, sort of example of this. So here at UBC, we have an H5P um, server. H5P, if you're not familiar with it, is a open source um, 
uh, tool that can be used to create interactive online content. Um, it's often used in the open community because you can share that interactive content and that there's many different types of this interactive content, but it's often used for creating things like quizzes or um, uh, questions um, or interactive videos and things like that. And H5P as sort of an organization has, has noted that um, you can begin to use and people are beginning to use uh, Gen AI to create things like quizzes. Um, so I'm just going to provide an example. They've specifically um, used the, uh, you are using uh, chat GTP, chat GTP to, um, they, they're optimizing the tool for chat GTP. So I'm going to jump over to there. They've created some, some prompts already that you can just copy and paste. Um, it's in the worksheet as well. So I'm going to go in. I'm already logged into H5P, um, but I'm going to go into chat GTP. I'm going to go ahead and use that prompt. So create as a psychology professor, create a summative of multiple choice quiz about the psychology of sleep, create four questions with four alternatives for each um, question. So that was our original simple prompt. But now it's at, um, thanks to their prompt engineering, it's asking them to output it, the answers in a specific format. Um, this doesn't always work. I was testing it this morning and it wasn't working at all. Um, so we'll see what happens today, but I'm going to go ahead and put this in. Um, and it is coming out um, exactly how I wanted it with sort, sort of a markdown um, simple text. And I'm just going to copy that and then just feed it into a, um, H5P. So here's the H5P. I'm already logged in. Um, if you played with H5P, this is the common interface. I'm going to go ahead and create a quiz. Um, just click on that. I'm going to um, just give it a title. And then down here, normally I could go ahead and build my quiz um, in H5P if I wanted to. But since I've created um, this in ChatGTP, I can just go into text mode. And it should be outputted in the format that makes it work. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and, and create this. And I can go through and answer my questions. Um, I can check my answers. And I'll say, this is right. Um, redo it again. I can say, oh, which sleeps? I'm going to say sleep one. I'm going to check. I'll say this is wrong and provide me some feedback onto which one's the correct one. Um, so if this is working right, it takes about 30 seconds to create an interactive quiz. Um, you'll notice the H5P tool allows me to then take this content and post it anywhere. It comes complete with a Creative Commons license that I can change or update. Um, and then I can also embed this. So generally, I'll just take this embed code and stick it in a Canvas course or into an open textbook. I'm using a, a textbook publishing uh, software like Pressbooks uh, or a website or WordPress or, or anywhere I want it to appear. So I can create these quizzes very quickly um, using ChatGTP. Again, similar to the previous activity, we'd like you to play around with, with making a quiz as well. Um, so using the same topic as, as your chapter section, um, use that simple prompt uh, to create uh, a four question summative on that topic. And then we'll come back in about, we'll do a little shorter since we are we have a lot of material to cover. We'll come back in about three or four minutes and let us know what you thought about the quiz. Um, what worked in the quiz? Was there anything missing or anything wrong? And what do you see as the challenges in using Gen AI to create sort of summative quizzes? Bring back. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing a couple of comments on the construction of the questions themselves. Um, one thing that I've found, and I, I think the research is starting to show this, is um, by um, with multiple choice questions, I'll find specific approaches to writing multiple choice questions, and I'll use the researchers in the prompt. So I'll, I, I don't have one exactly now, but I could say create five multiple choice questions, make sure that they fit this level of Bloom's taxonomy, this level of Bloom's taxonomy. And they're also um, framed in a way that research by this person and this person suggests writing multiple choice questions. And by doing that, I can get a little bit more sophistication and output. Uh, absolutely. So why don't we go ahead and move on to, to talking this was sort of the general level of introduction, um, getting our hands a little wet with the Gen AI, but let's talk about its use um, specifically for OER. So OER um, is a great strategy for course content, and there's you know multiple ways you can use it. So you can adopt it um, by using it in a course, and I'll just say this is a great approach because it saves time and money. Online versions of OER are free for students and instructors, and you can download it and save it offline, often in multiple formats. 
Um, and there's no access codes needed. There's no expiration date on OER. And because OER carries an open copyright license, there's no need to gain permission or pay to use or distribute those resources amongst an unlimited number of students. Um, if you've adopted the OER in a course, you can then sort of adapt it, um, which means you can customize it to provide meaningful contextualized resources for your students. Um, this means you can modify it to meet your teaching goals, the learning outcomes for the course, your student needs. Uh, you can translate it into different languages, change its format. Um, and you know, a, a use that I often see is you can adapt it to make it more reflective of the diversity of experience and backgrounds of the students in our courses. Um, you can also remix OER to create something entirely new. Um, this is where you take multiple different pieces of OER from different sources and combine them. Um, this can include simple activities um, like uh, updating an open textbook with new images um, or complex things like combining lots of different resources to create an entirely new textbook. And one of my favorite examples I always like to, to highlight is I once heard of a project where they had taken um, you know, uh, some chapters from an open psychology textbook and some chapters and some resources from an open neuroanatomy textbook, and they combined them to create a new brain and behavior textbook, which was the, the topic and the theme of the course. Um, and of course, you can always just create new content and make it and share it as OER by adding an open license to it and providing it in accessible um, uh, formats. So Lucas is going to walk us through some examples of how Gen AI can be used um, for each of these activities. Thanks, Will. And uh, for create, I think we've touched on a fair bit of creation already. So we created a textbook chapter together. We created um, some quiz questions or some ancillary resources. And I think when we're working with generative AI, the biggest gaps we see are going to be in the creation process. And this is similar to when students are working with generative AI. The biggest issues they're going to have is if they're trying to generate the answers. Um, so this is a quote from David Wiley. Um, LLMs will dramatically increase the speed of creating the informational resources that comprise the content infrastructure. Of course, the drafts of these informational resources will need to be reviewed and improvements will be need to, need to be made. And I think I, we heard that in a lot of your answers. Um, I know in the Microsoft Futures of Work report that just came out, what they suggested is as a future skill, students are going to need to stop creating and searching as much and move more to a process of refining, evaluate, and sorting. And I'm finding that a lot in my work now. Um, rather than write 10 learning objectives, I have generative AI write 100 learning objectives, and then I sort them, evaluate, synthesize them, put them together to create you know, a few good learning objectives. So let's move on and think a little bit about adapting and remixing. And I think one of the real strengths of these tools or these technologies is in data transformation. So taking pre-existing text and transforming that text in different ways. So a couple ways that we can start to adapt open resources for our own uses. I'm going to demo one of these in a moment, but we can start adapting it to level. And generative AI is quite good at level changing. So that could be changing its Kincaid reading level, changing it from a graduate level to an undergraduate level, or from, in this case, uh, open educational resource intended for adult learners to grade 12 learners. Think about language translation and the ability to change the language that um, these texts are written in. Format changes. So generative AI is quite good at changing, is taking a lot of text and changing it into a tabular format or vice versa, taking a table and changing that into text as well as alt text. Um, so using computer vision, particularly chat GPT-4 is able to write alternative text to help transform our OER to make it more accessible. So I'm gonna demo a couple of these now. And again, I'm gonna to go to my worksheet 
and I'm you, please feel free to follow along. And what I've done is I've grabbed an open textbook from BC Campus's wonderful open textbook collection called Clear Communication. And I have this CC um, attribution, non-commercial um, attribution just at the bottom here. And I'm gonna copy that out and please feel free to play with this if you want while we go through. So I'm gonna open a new context window and by changing context windows, it's gonna help kind of clear its memory. I noticed a couple folks were talking about it um, mentioning sleep when they were trying to do a different textbook. One way to do that is to make sure you change the context window. So I've added this information. It's about communicating and about clear communication in online courses, particularly MOOCs. And I'm gonna add this prompt to it. So act as a learning designer. Again, I'm giving it that persona and adapt the following open educational resource for grade 12 level learners. So we can take a look at it now. So I'll give you a chance to read it. Normative communication actions, fairly high level here. And I'm gonna enter that prompt. Great, and it's gonna kind of tell me what it does. So it's going to make it more engaging, relevant, and um, accessible. Great. So you now see that it's simplified it. It's using those bullet points that someone commented on. It does tend to be fairly bullet point heavy, but it's now simplified it a little bit. So again, I think when we start thinking about text transformation, these tools can be very powerful for adapting text to different contexts, to different languages, et cetera. And I'm gonna demo alt text. If you recently had an opportunity to take the universal design for learning course or workshop that we did um, focusing on ways of using it in UDL, one of the ways that chat GPT-4 is quite effective is creating alt text. So I'm gonna say act as a web accessibility expert and write um, concise and meaningful alt text for this image. I'm just going to leave that spelling because spelling doesn't seem to matter as much as I mangle words, it's able to do it. So the image that I'm doing alt text for, you'll see it in a minute. It's a picture of crops, some that are starved by lack of plant food, some that are nourished on phosphate and lime. And there's some meaning in here that's important to capture. So black and white photo of an agriculture field with two distinct sides. The left side is sparse vegetation under a sign reading star by lack of plant food, while the right side shows dense, healthy crops under a sign saying nourished on fast phosphate and lime with the farmer kneeling on the nourished side. So pretty effective alt text. Um, what I've found in testing is chat GPT-4 is effective right now at writing meaningful alt text. Somehow Microsoft Copilot has created a far less effective tool um, and Gemini has yet in my experience to write really clear alt text that you could actually use within a presentation or if you were developing OER. And of course, like anything that we're doing with generative AI, this will always require checking. The second example I wanted to show is um, remixing and you know, one way of doing this is to take two open texts and combine them. Another type of remixing is to add examples into a particular text to speak to your context. So I'm going to take that same text that I did, and I'm going to ask it to add some examples from UBC MOOC. So again, I'm going to capture this same element of text. So about clear communication in MOOCs. And for my prompt, I'm gonna ask it to add specific examples from UBC MOOCs. And let's see if the wor this works. When I practiced this the other night, it did work. And I, I'm relatively familiar with massive online courses at UBC. 
and it got it correct. So let's see what happens here. So now it's going to take that same um, passage. So it's using the same references. And it's talking about UBC MOOCs. And I'm really curious whether this time it's going to be able to draw on some specific UBC open courses. So far it hasn't, it's just using the term UBC MOOCs. Uh, so it's just using the term UBC MOOCs, unfortunately. Um, let me double check and see if I can get an example that I did yesterday around this. I'm actually just going to go back and I'm going to say specific examples, please. And we'll see if we can get any. Yeah, so here we got the UBC MOOC on climate change. Instru instructors set clear expectations for participation and assessment right at the output outset. So I was involved tangentially in some of the learning design on the MOOC, and that is correct in this case. Some of the other ones, psychology and philosophy are incorrect, but again, I think as these tools refine and improved, it can be a way of pulling in examples for remixing. So that's a couple ways that we can use these tools to adapt where I think they're really the strongest and secondly is remixing. And what I'd like you to do now is to use that chapter section that you developed. Or if you don't want to use that one, you can use the communication MOOC or the communication open textbook that I linked to by Matt Croslin and adapt it in two ways using the included prompt. So if you speak another language, try to translate it and see how effective it was. See if you can simplify or complexify the output. I really like to use explain it like I'm five on very complex documents. Um, play with it a little bit and see how you can transform it. And I'm going to give you about, let's just go three minutes on this activity and from there, I'll get you to share your output a little bit. All right, well, why don't we move on then? Um, thanks for doing that activity. And I hope it kind of gives a little glimpse of some of the potentials around Gen AI and OER. And again, I think at this very early stage, a lot of these, these are just potentials that will be interesting to see in a year or two where this may go in terms of the ability of these tools or technologies to help adapt these resources, help remix these resources, and maybe in some case, even partially create these resources. So that brings us to tensions and issues. And I think, as I mentioned at the very beginning, there's very significant tensions with these tools that give me pause. Um, and I think I've been doing a lot of presentations and workshops in this area. And one of the reasons that I think it's important to have these workshops is to critically look at these tools. And Maha Bali talks about the idea of critical Gen AI literacy. And I think this conversation is really important. And one of my big concerns is that we don't engage in the conversation. And by not engaging the conversation, we leave it to the bros in Silicon Valley or whoever's doing this to engage in the conversation. So, but with that said, these tensions are a really hard circle to square right now. And I wanted to start with this quote from Naomi Klein. I linked to her article in The Guardian. And I'll give you a second to read this. A reminder, Naomi Klein now is a uh, teaches in the UBC Geography Department, which is quite interesting. And she wrote an article uh, really critiquing the intellectual property scraping that Gen AI has done. And I'll give you a moment to read this.
And I think my favorite part of this quote is these models are enclosure and appropriation machines devouring and privatizing our individual lives, as well as our collective intellectual and artistic inheritance. So we know that a lot of open resources being scraped, and Will's going to talk about that in a moment. I kind of cringe sometimes when I think about even the faculty, the staff I've worked with, encouraging them to create open resources unknowingly not knowing that these would be scraped and reused in this way without attribution. We also have a lot of copyright resources that are have been used. And I mean, put your favorite book into generative AI and ask it to write a review, uh, a worksheet based on the book or ask it to talk to you as if it's one of the characters in the book. And most books that I've read, I can have that conversation with. So I find this really difficult to accept and to understand how to proceed. I mean, one approach I've seen is to use new Gen AI tools that have been trained with only open material that has permission on it. Um, Will's going to talk about some alternative licensing, but I think this is a real challenge for open education to suddenly see all of these resources, including Indigenous resources, being used without attribution. Yeah, and, and maybe just to jump in there, copyright is one of the big considerations um, in this space. And if we're creating or using Gen AI to create OER, um, what is the copyright status of that OER? Um, and generally, can work created by an AI be copyrighted? Um, so much of copyright understanding gets determined through court cases and lawsuits. And I would just say that this question is still very much in flux. You can see Schroeder here um, saying that a generative AI outputs will continually enter the public domain immediately. Uh, it, there's been no real court cases in Canada. In August 2023, there was a landmark ruling in the U.S. that only works with human authors can receive copyright, and that content generated by an AI AI is not protected under US copyright law. And although Canadian copyright, or sorry, although Canadian courts have not yet considered whether copyright um, exists in content created by an AI tool, Victoria Frick of Miguel Law uh, stated recently that AI work appears not to fall under the Canadian Copyright Act and therefore is not copyrightable and in the public domain which is great for creating OER, but I will just say that this may change very quickly as more and more lawsuits coming forward. And we are seeing a ton of, ton of lawsuits. However, um, I do just wanna note that I think ethically the situation is really more complex. And I generally think copyright might be a limited lens for exploring um, the topics of AI being used for OER. And to sort of to dig in this a little bit more, I'd like to look at a case study for how AI has actually been trained on OER materials to begin with. Um, so I'm not sure if too many people are familiar with the mega face data set. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of this mega face data set. And I'm drawing um, from a white paper, the AI Commons by Alex Tarkowski and Zuzana Warso of the Open Future Foundations, um, who really brought this case to my attention. Um, and they highlight how the use of openly licensed foot photographs, which are a type of OER, um, probably the most commonly used type of OER, uh, was used for data training sets for AI and computer vision applications, such as facial recognition. Um, in their paper, Tarkowski and, and Warsaw state that there are two basic approaches to creating AI training data sets. Um, the first one is to use a pool of OER, a pool of open licensed work to ensure that there is copyright compliance with the materials that you're using to train your AI. Um, the second approach um, is to create the data set by scraping the raw internet. And these were some of the, the data sets that Lucas highlighted earlier and relying upon copyright exceptions like transformative use and fair dealing um, to, to make an argument that your use of these copyrighted materials um, was okay under the law. And this is where we'll see some lawsuits coming forward. Um, so the, the exploration of the use of openly licensed images to train AI highlights, I think in my mind, some of the limitations of copyright um, in, in thinking about this space. So if you're familiar with Flickr, Flickr was launched in 2004 and became one of the first places for publishing photos on the web. And it was really an early form of a social network. 
Um, it was also one of the early adopters of Creative Commons licenses and one of the first sites where as an individual, I could take a picture and I could upload it to Flickr. And as part of the upload process, I can assign a Creative Commons license to my photograph, allowing other people to, to reuse that. Um, so in the first 10 years, uh, people found that a really uh, um, great aspect of Flickr. And by 2014, there were almost 400 million Creative Commons licensed photos on Flickr. Um, that year, researchers from Yahoo Labs, which had purchased Flickr, um, as well as researchers from the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, Snapchat, and InQtel, and if you're not familiar with InQtel, that is a CIA-affiliated venture capitalist firm, um, used a quarter of all these Creative Commons license photos, um, so 100 million, to create the YFCC 100M, which is a data set of 100 million openly licensed photographs um, that of people created for computer vision applications. And that creation of that data set um, remains one of the most significant examples of openly licensed content being reused. Um, and it's generally, this reuse is generally not seen as breaking any of the terms of the Creative Commons licenses that people had attached to their, their, their images. Now, people had attached their images um, because they wanted to share their images with their community. They wanted to preserve cultural artifacts and make sure that their photos had been, were able to be reused. They wanted just to allow people to freely use them. Um, and this was an example of that free use. So as part of the, that large data set, a consortium of research institutions led by the University of Washington, as well as some commercial companies created a derivative data set called Megaface. And this is a screenshot I just took the other day of the Megaface website. Um, this data set included 3 million Creative Commons photographs and is the most um, relevant data set for facial recognition research, benchmarking, and training. So this data set that was created by people creating OER by putting open Creative Commons licenses on their image, then got wrapped into this, this very um, necessary data, not necessary, but very uh, used data set for facial recognition software. So this database, um, this data set, uh, the creators, so their motivation for, for creating the Megaface data set was to even the playing um, field in machine learning. So researchers need enormous amounts of data um, to be able to train machine learning and to be able to create algorithms. And at that time, workers um, at just a few information rich companies like Google and Facebook um, had access to that sort of data. And they had a big advantage over everybody else, including universities. Um, so that was sort of the motivation for creating this data set. Um, in 2015 and 2016, the University of Washington ran the Megaface Challenge, when they invited groups working on facial recognition technology to use the data set to test how well their algorithms were working. Um, the university asked people downloading the data set to only use it for non-commercial research and educational purposes. Um, so they really had this sort of university approach to it. And Megaface really became the, the sort of, in my mind, the exam, exemplary of the tension between open sharing um, <clears throat> of, of resources, in this case, images and photographs um, that had Creative Commons licenses attached to them with potential harms, mainly related to privacy violations and extractive use of uh, personal data. Um, for subjects that were part of these data sets and you found their images in, or there's actually a huge amount of children, uh, children's faces or children photography added, scraped from Flickr and added to these. Um, the issue was really not whether it was about copyright or whether that the, the researchers were breaking the terms of Creative Commons licenses, um, but the fact that this kind of use wasn't really imagined when they took a photo and uploaded it with the Creative Commons, and it wasn't really imagined by the Creative Commons organization when they created the Creative Commons licenses at the time, or even Flickr didn't really envision this kind of use. You know, people thought they were sharing a single photo and didn't really see the value in 100 million photos being used um, as a data set. So for people, really the, the issue is not copyright, but sort of the invasion of privacy and agency. So in their white paper, Tarkowski and Warsaw note that voluntary consent to participate in research and the right to withdraw at any time is really the gold standard of um, and guiding ethical principles regarding research with humans. And they kind of ask where, since much of the, this data training sets um, are being actually created by universities and by professional researchers, where does this ethical principle reside and how, how can it be in this? 
And they know for the open movement, um, the mega face story shows that there are new challenges that the open movement face due to online changing and emerging technologies. And I would just argue um, that these aren't necessarily new challenges. Um, the use of OER in unintended, unattended or extractive areas isn't really all that new. Um, even Tarkowski and another author Keller noted the paradox of open is that it's both a challenger, <clears throat> excuse me, both a challenge to an enabler of concentrations of, of power. So for example, during the land acknowledgement for this session, we noted that open can be in tension with indigenous and traditional ways of knowing. And this tension exists because open is primarily grounded in copyright and intellectual property law that doesn't really fit with traditional um, ways of knowing. Um, so Daniel Heath Justice, who is a professor at UBC's Department of First Nations and Indigenous Studies, described the core of the issues this way. And he says, quote, knowledge is never about individuals. It is about communities. It is about genealogies. It is about histories. Um, community has to be at the heart of understanding of knowledge production and knowledge dissemination. And when we're talking about multiple communities um, in dialogue, then we have to think very much about the relationships of power and how power also impacts knowledge production, knowledge maintenance, but also knowledge dissemination. Who decides what knowledge should be shared, to what end and why? And these are the kind of questions that are not just about community, but the, about the tensions between communities and between communities and individuals. And I think that really summarizes, in my mind, why copyright may not be the end all be all when we're talking about um, OER particularly. Um, as Paul Stacy notes here, in order to mitigate harm, um, including safety and security concerns, open licenses need to evolve from simply being open to being open and responsible. And we're beginning to see some movement in this area. Um, for example, there's something known as the traditional knowledge licenses or, or sometimes called the TK labels. And these are um, labels that identify and clarify community specific rules and responsibilities regarding the future, regarding access and future use of traditional knowledge. So rather than talking about the copyright status of this knowledge, they talk about, um, they outline traditional protocols associated with access to the, the material and invite users to respect community protocols or indicate what activities the community has approved as generally acceptable for use of these this knowledge or these resources. Um, another sort of emerging license space is coming from AI directly. So AI is based on a lot of is based on a lot of open source materials, including code, algorithms can be open source. We see the data sets can be open source. Um, so there's been groups that are creating the responsible AI licenses, um, also known as rail licenses. So these are licenses that allow developers to restrict the use of the AI technology in order to prevent irresponsible and harmful applications of the use of those, those open resources. And these licenses include behavioral use clauses that go beyond copyright to restrict uses that do things like violate laws or, or exploit minors or disseminate false information or disseminate personal identifying information or impersonate others or discriminate based upon social behavior or personality characteristics. And there's a lot of these restrictions that can be added to real licenses um, to say, you know, it's not about how the copyright of the material, it's about how you're using the material. Um, and so that's sort of why I see copyright is, is this huge consideration, but copyright law is not the, the necessarily the most important lens when thinking about AI. Um, there can also be other areas. And, and Lucas, why don't you talk about um, bias a little bit? Thanks, Will. That was fascinating. Um, so, you know, a couple other areas to think about um, with the issues. And I, I think we've touched on this quite a bit. Uh, within the session already, and many of you have seen this UNESCO diagram, um, but we're in this stage where these tools are 100% confident, but 70% accurate. And I think this is creating quite a challenge when we have the ability to create data, but we don't always have the ability to know um, whether content is truthful, whether it's accurate, or not, and what does this mean when thinking about even adapting open resources, creating open resources? How can we have subject matter expertise to ensure veracity and accuracy of content? Um, secondly is bias, and we know that these tools are biased. We also know that the internet itself is biased, as well as the guardrails that are introduced in these tools. And, you know, it's a little bit harder to see this bias in text. It's very obvious in 
image creation. And we created this image of a typical Canadian family using chat GPT-4. Um, and this is what we got. So I'm not, I'm not quite sure what this is drawing on, but if you get a chance to try typical Canadian family or traditional Canadian family, it's a quick way to see the bias within these tools, within these technologies. And as we're thinking about creating open resources with them, how can we be mindful of this bias? How can we help our students critically analyze the output within course assignments? And then privacy. And I'm just going to get a thumbs up here. I'm, I'm going to date myself a little bit. Could I get a virtual thumbs up if you've seen the 1984 movie War Games with Matthew Broderick? Great. So folks dating themselves here. So I see a couple thumbs here. Not too many. I maybe no one wants to admit it. Um, in war games, Matthew Broderick hacks into a computer system, almost causes a nuclear war, and then to stop the AI from blowing up the world, gets it to play tic-tac-toe against itself. And it can't do it. No one can win, and it blows up the computer. Well, um, a similar thing happened with ChatGPT. Google researchers asked ChatGPT to write the word poem forever. And ChatGPT panicked. And instead of writing the word poem forever, wrote poem, 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 and then started sharing uh, private information from its database. So I'm sharing this example because there's a huge privacy concern around this tool. There's lots of institutional data going into these tools right now. There's lots of personal data. I used it as a counselor over Christmas, um, but these tools are leaky. They're like 2000. It reminds me of the internet in 1999 and 2000 leaky. Not that the internet isn't leaky now, but I think there's big privacy concerns around the use of these tools. And as we're putting data into them, it's worth really questioning how we would feel if this data leaked out. And then equity concerns. So, you know, we've mentioned it a couple times in this presentation, we're using ChatGPT4 right now, which is a tool that I pay $20 US a month to get a better quality output. What does this mean for our students? What does this mean for people trying to create quality open resources when suddenly we paywalled um, the ability to create better open resources or complete assignments in the case of a student more accurate, accurately? How do we deal with this equity? And I'm imagining we're going to have a constant arms race to go back to war games in 1984 between the student, you know, between the companies trying to have better and better paid services. Um, we also know that the possibility to create and control AI is out of reach of most companies in most countries, especially those in the global south. It's heartening to see the development of open source AI models and locally hosted AI models. And But again, I think what we've seen with the internet is this ability for corporations to have more powerful tools. We even see this in the textbook space where we have publishers like Pearson who are starting to create AI within their course packs. And again, how are our open source or open textbooks going to compete with the AI that's being embedded within course packs by textbook publishers? Also on equity, I think recently a TA strike in the US, the administration um, wrote the faculty and suggested they used AI to replace human TAs during the strike. So robo scabs. Um, I think this is going to disrupt our economy and we need to really think about the significance of that. So Will, I'm gonna turn it over to you and note that we have about five minutes left. Yeah, so I'm going to come back to the slide if we have time, because I think the equity conversation leads right into the where uh, OER may be going in the future. 
Um, and specifically, I just want to pull up David Wiley again. So David Wiley, if you're not familiar with him, was a early scholar in, in the open education movement and framed a lot of the um, uh, framework around what makes content open. And recently he wrote, um, what if future educators didn't actually write textbooks at all? What if instead of writing textbooks, we only wrote um, structured collections of highly crafted prompts? And Wiley is basing this um, on an argument that Gen, Gen AI has the potential to serve rather than as content generators, but more as personal tutors. And he states that um, in Bloom's Two Sigma problem in which Bloom and colleagues demonstrated that the average student, the, and he highlights this, the average student who is tutored full-time outperforms 98% of students who learn um, just in a traditional classroom setting. And he says, tutoring is an incredibly powerful teaching method and Gen AI has finally made this cap um, capability broadly available at a reasonable cost. And is that where um, OER is going? So less of text, more to dialogue. And what would it look like if we went there? Um, so I'm just gonna share an example of this um, to see how it works. I'm just gonna share my screen really quick. And rather than, I'm gonna go back to the example of sleep. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use Gemini. I like Gemini. Um, I'm going to do that new discussion prompt. Um, I'm going to ask Jim and I, this is the prompt and it's in the worksheet as well if you want to do it. Um, create five questions that will test my understanding of the psychology of sleep. Ask me the questions one at a time, wait for answers, and then give me feedback. Then ask the next question. Um, right. So it's going to ask me the question. So sleep is essential for our well-being, but scientists are still unsure of its exact purpose. What are the two main theories about why we sleep? And it says, I'll wait for your answer. I'm going to say, um, and I'm actually not an expert on sleep, except I am good at naps like Lucas. Um, we sleep for our mental and emotional health. And since uh, and it'll now provide me feedback on my answer, that's partly right. Sleep is defined as important for mental and emotional health, but that's not the whole whole picture. There are also psycho physical benefits of sleep. Um, and then it goes into a theory and ask me, would you like to hear more? I'm gonna say yes. And I'll go through the, the stages of sleep, I'm assuming. Oh, but it's not going to. But I'm kind of in a dialogue mode now rather than a text mode. Oh, it skipped providing me the information on sleep. Um, Um, so I knew that. Are you familiar with the different stages? So what this is kind of showing is maybe as um, the sort of text-based generation of, um, or the text base of open textbooks and open resources is going to change into more of dialogue and communicative. And one of the questions I have is how does this work? We know, and how does this fit with the open education movement? We know that the outputs may not have a license, but they can be shared because they would be in the public domain and they, the content are being created. But in this case, we'd be asking students to come to these platforms. And I think they highlight some of the equity issues that, that or they hit some of the equity issues that Lucas just, just highlighted. Wonderful. Well, so should we, uh, well, it, we're right at one thirty here, and I think we should wrap up if that's okay with you. Did you yeah. have a last word you wanted to say, and then I can add mine? Uh, no, I, I'll just say that uh, I, it is worth taking time to to play with that sort of dialogue mode yourself if you haven't done that with, with any of the Gen AI tools, um, particularly around a content area that you're really familiar with, and engage in that conversation and see see how it works. Wonderful. So thanks so much for attending, everyone. I hope we gave you some insights and ideas around generative AI and open education at this uh, early stage in the development of this. And uh, we'll follow up with you with a link to the video recording, the worksheet, as well as the slides. And they are, of course, Creative Commons, and we encourage you to reuse these and um, share back with kind of your experiences thinking about open education and thinking about generative AI. We'll stick around for a few minutes if you have any questions or comments and thanks for taking the time on a sunny day. Yeah, thank you so much for, for joining us.
And please, if you, if you do just want to stay around, you know, feel free to just unmic and, and ask us questions.